All right, so if you turn in your Bibles to the book of Philippians, chapter 2, we're going to be looking at a passage tonight, verses 6 to 7, which most Bible scholars and commentators would agree that these verses are difficult. So it's needful for us to address this section of Scripture. So in Philippians, chapter 2, verses 6 to 7, we read that verse this morning. From the King James, it reads, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, or literally he emptied himself, and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. One of the things about difficult or hard sections of scripture, it's a challenge for us as believers when we're doing our own personal study in the Word of God, not to avoid those sections just because they are a little bit more difficult than something like John 3.16, which is pretty easy to understand. Some scripture isn't so easy to understand, and so we can't just kind of put that off. We need to lean upon the Holy Spirit and look at the context of those verses and just, you know, really compare scripture with scripture to figure out what on earth is this particular verse or passage talking about, right? Don't shy away from that because the Lord's going to bless you if you move forward with trying to to understand it. And so here's exactly a section of scripture that I've studied over the years. And for those of you who may not know me or know my background, I do have a master's degree in theology. So I'm up here because the Lord called me to teach. And so that's what I'm doing. Uh, He didn't call me into the pastorate. And I've prayed about that over the years, and I just don't feel that calling. But the Lord's always impressed upon my heart to teach. And I am willing, therefore, to share whatever the Lord uh, shows me in Scripture with those here at this church or even anywhere else. I I do, you know, post things out there on the Internet, on a blog, and on YouTube and other places. Uh, But, you know, I'm I'm not in it for notoriety or anything like that. I just want people to learn and understand what the Word of God says. Now let's take a look at this scripture verse here in chapter 2, verse 6. This phrase, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, as it stands in the King James Version. You'll find that translation in the New King James Version, Young's Literal Translation, Darby, and even Webster. If you didn't know it, Webster uh, even has a translation of the... uh, of the, the whole Bible, too. And so there's quite a few translations out there into English that you may, you may not even be aware of, but they're there. <clears throat> now, that particular translation doesn't make a lot of sense to the modern reader. I know the first time I read that, I'm like, what is that talking about? Like, didn't, didn't consider it robbery to be equal with God. What, what is that talking about? <clears throat> Now, this phrase is translated, if you have a version here other than the King James, does anybody here have a version other than the King James translation tonight? Oh, good, no heretics. No, I'm just joking. (laughs) There are some issues with some of the other modern English translations, but uh, that's that's something that is very involved as far as study goes. But the King James version is good because it sticks with the received text. It doesn't play games with deleting and removing phrases or words from the, uh, the Bible itself. At any rate, I do look at these other translations just out of curiosity to see how other scholars translated some things into English. So here in the New International Version, not my favorite version, they translate this particular verse, who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. In the Christian Standard Bible, another translation, they say, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Okay? The New American Standard Bible, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. Okay? And then Revised Standard Version follows suit with that same idea as well. So you got a variety of translations, and they all kind of follow a different path there in terms of how they rendered that original Greek language. Does that help at all? No. (laughs) It didn't help me looking at that. It doesn't really capture the true English translation of what Paul was trying to say here. 
So, and then that phrase in verse 7, or I'm sorry, the uh, phrase, yes, in verse 7, which the King James uh, has as made of no reputation. You find that one also in the New King James Version and the Webster's translation as well. That's a translation of a, a Greek word that literally means, the Greek word literally does mean empty to evacuate, like removing the water out of a cup or sucking the air out of a room or just evacu to taking something and just evacuating out of it, right? That's what the literal meaning of the word is. So some translations will have that he emptied himself. But what does that actually mean? I mean, Christ emptied himself. What does that mean? So we find that, those, that particular Greek phrase translated uh, about two different ways in the English versions. Not as all over the map as you would have with the thought not at robbery to be equal with God. That one had a lot more and even more uh, translations than what I mentioned. This one either you fall one way or the other. It either says, like in the New, Interna the New International Version, rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. The New American Standard Bible uh, says, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bond servant and being made in the likeness of men. So you either go one way or the other. King James say no reputation, essentially saying nothing, uh, like the New International Version. What, is he, what do you mean he made himself nothing, right? That doesn't really help understand what Paul's saying here either. So these translators are trying, they're trying, but it's difficult to bring this over into the English. That's the problem here, is it sometimes with foreign languages, it's difficult to bring what it, the meaning of a particular foreign phrase uh, over into another language. It happens all the time. <clears throat> and so that's what we have here. It's just trying to grapple with how do we really express the meaning behind what Paul was saying. And so because the translation and even the interpretation of these phrases are challenging, heretics have misused this passage. Uh, there are those who will try to say that Christ stopped being God when he became, became man, or that Christ suspended the use of his divine attributes, and on and on it goes. Even some conservative Bible commentators have misinterpreted it. So we've got to be careful because it's difficult. And this is where the heretics love to jump in and use all these difficult passages in scripture to promote their false doctrines. And if you're not a student of the word of God, you can be susceptible to uh, their uh, deception. So right now, our focus is on understanding tonight what these phrases mean in the context of the letter to the Philippians, as well as the whole of scripture, comparing scripture with scripture. We're gonna do, be doing part of it tonight, and Lord willing, part of it uh, next Sunday night, and trying to get into these two particular verses. And he, just to pause for a second, because when Paul wrote this letter through the Holy Spirit to the Philippians, was he writing this to a group of scholars? To people who are academic? people who were just uh, part of the aristocracy of the day, or just to the ordinary person? The answer is to the ordinary people of, of Philippi. And so the message that Paul was given was not complicated. It was very simple. <clears throat> so we'll get into a little bit of exposition here of this verse. What did the Holy Spirit through Paul really mean by this passage? And so we talk about the context. Remember, one of the most important things when you're studying scripture is the context that it occurs in. That's why you often hear, if you ever go to uh, Bible college or take any kind of Bible classes anywhere, the big emphasis is you gotta know who the letter was written to, when it was written, where it was written. It's, there's a lot of important background information, even the culture of the people who the letter was written to that has a very important bearing on the meaning of what's in that letter, right? We can't interpret that necessarily according to our modern culture and understanding of things. But although we can take what was meant for the people of the first century and bring it over to our understanding in the 21st century, which, you know, it's hard to believe 21, you know, 21st century compared to the time our, our Lord ascended into heaven. And it's like, Lord, please come back. <laughs> Lord, we pray for that. But here, in terms of uh, this passage uh, to the Philippians, uh, 
the context plays a key role in understanding what verse 6 and 7 are all about. So both chapters 1 and 2 emphasize uh, two things, humility and selflessness as the proper attitude for believers. Now there are other themes within the book of the Philippians, within that letter, one of being unity is another big theme. Uh, you know, Lord willing, maybe one of these days I'll uh, actually go through the book of Philippians and do a study on the unity that as believers we're called to uh, as a body. But here we're going to focus on humility and selflessness. Uh, now Paul, Paul's example in Christ, of course, uh, Paul was humble. Would we agree with that? That Paul the apostle was humble. He was absolutely humble. Despite his persecution and lowly condition of imprisonment, now remember, Paul was imprisoned at the, at the point he was writing this letter to the Philippians. And he was imprisoned because he was a criminal? Well, according to Rome, they said he was a criminal. No, because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, right, for his faith. And Paul was willing to, to put up with that imprisonment, meaning to endure that imprisonment for the sake of Christ. He actually counted it a joy to be able to, to be in prison for the Lord. His difficult circumstances, he said in chapter 1, verses 12 to 18, I'm not going to read those tonight. And just a reminder, I will be providing these notes to anybody that wants them. And so when I'm done, I'm going to take a raise of hands and I'll make sure I have those notes available for next Sunday night. He knew in verses, we read in verses 12 to 18 of chapter 1, that his difficult circumstances uh, had helped further the gospel. And that was what Paul really was glad about, that he was able to know that others were hearing about his circumstances and then hearing about the gospel and getting saved. Even in the palace of Caesar, there were people who were getting saved. And to Paul, that, that's why he was here. Paul put the Lord, Paul himself said in verse 20, Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. No matter what, Paul knew that the Lord was using him. Paul put himself first? No, the, Paul put the Lord first and became a living sacrifice for him. We read that, uh, about that also in, in the book of Acts and Romans. So Paul was humble. Paul was also selfless. And this is important. Despite Paul's desire to be at home with the Lord, who wouldn't want to be at home with the Lord? That would just be wonderful. Paul said that would be wonderful. Uh, that would to, uh, bid to his own gain. His own gain. He says that in verses 21 to 23 of chapter 1. But he desired more to remain in this world, to minister to believers for Christ's sake, even though that meant additional affliction for him. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you, Paul tells him in verse 24. He also noted, he said, yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. We read that in chapter 2, verse 17. And Paul was also altruistic, that is, disinterested in himself. He wasn't thinking about Paul, and he wasn't interested in what Paul needed. He was more interested in what the believers in Philippi and other places needed. Despite his lack of personal presence at the church of Philippi, well, he wanted to be there. He really, he really loved the, uh, <clears throat> the Philippians. He beseeched them through this letter to share in the sufferings for Christ. He wanted them to do the same thing as he was doing to endure the persecution, to live holy lives, and to be united with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel in verse 27 of chapter 1. We talked a little bit about that this morning, about our need to live holy lives. Paul truly cared about the believers in Philippi above himself. That's the key, above himself. The book of Philippians also, Paul brings out the example of Timothy, who was, a, who was a faithful son in the faith. And Paul had all confidence in Timothy, whom he wanted to send to the Philippians as an encouragement. 
<clears throat> and we, all, we read about that in chapter 2. Uh, Ep- Epaphroditus was another example, someone else that was a servant uh, to the Lord who Paul trusted. And there were only certain people Paul knew he could really trust. And he trusted Epaphroditus, who also exhibited selflessness and his love for the Lord in service. We read about that also in chapter 2. And then finally, <clears throat> Paul exhorts them in light of Christ's example. And here's where in chapter 2, Paul is bringing forth to them the ultimate example of selflessness, and that is with Christ. Paul urged the Philippians to let nothing to be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, in other words, humility, let each esteem others better than himself. That's verse 3 of chapter 2. Paul pressed the Philippians to be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. That's verse 2 of chapter 2. But how? He says, by emulating our Lord. In verse 5, it says, let this mind, which he just said to them, be of one mind. Now he says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Verse 5. So he's now setting up what he's going to talk about in verses 6 down through verse 11. So what was the mind, in other words, the attitude of Christ? What was it? It was one of genuine humility and selflessness. This is the focus of Philippians 2, 6 to 7, this idea of selflessness on the part of Christ. Paul explains to these believers how Christ was selfless. Now, the difficulty of these verses, of course, has spawned many different interpretations among both conservative and liberal theologians. The liberals, we expect that. The conservative theologians, it seems like you retake different commentaries and they come away with different ideas here. Many of these explanations, though, in the commentaries, and believe I've been been through quite a few of them, they overcomplicate the passage. It's like can't see the forest for the trees idea. It's so wrapped up in all the little technical details in the original language and phraseology and trying to go back and look at the culture or expressions in other languages and so forth that they just don't see the simplicity of the message here. And they come away with something that I don't think the Philippians would have even thought of. Uh, So instead... uh, And what also happens is sometimes this moves into the realm of heresy, where people start teaching things that are clearly not biblical, like Christ gave up his deity to become man. Clearly not what the scripture teaches. Rather, the message here is very simple. I mentioned that before. Centers around the selflessness of Christ, and and because we need to keep the passage anchored in its context, and that is talking about selflessness. And granted, Paul used language from the Greek in this passage that isn't as easy to understand as John 3.16. It's very straightforward, very easy Greek. But the Greek language he used here is a little tricky because it doesn't translate over as well into English. But if we stick to the context and the context clues, then we can... uh, you know, narrow in, we can zoom into a meaning, a meaning of these, of these verses that fits Scripture, doesn't deviate, doesn't go beyond what other Scripture says about the, about the divine nature of our Savior. So verse 6, and I'll read here, it's a translation from the Greek that I, I myself had done, and not lightly either. I spent a considerable amount of time Uh, looking into this, poured over a lot of technical information, read a lot of technical commentaries, uh, did a lot of careful analysis to make sure that I was doing justice to the original Greek and trying to bring it over into English in a way that might might just capture what it's trying to say here. So in verse 6, this translated, who, being in the form of God, did not consider the fact of being equal with God, something to seize upon or to hold on to. Uh, 
<clears throat> again, maybe doesn't really explain it, but you'll understand when we go through this. That's as close as I could get it to what I think the English is saying. And you'll understand what ex where I'm uh, getting at here with that translation. Now it says, who being in the form of God, that word form there uh, has reference to the divine nature, which is truly and essentially divine. We know the son didn't merely possess the appearance of God. He just didn't look like God. And he was God with all the attributes of God. Everything that makes God who he is, Christ possessed because he is God. And we know that from John 1.1 1, 1 and other scripture verses. The same applies to him taking upon himself a human nature. He didn't just appear as a human being like he did in the Old Testament in the theophanies as they're called or the Christophanies when he appeared unto different people. He didn't just look human. He, his, he possessed every attribute of humanity, apart from sin, of course, without sacrificing his deity at all. Fully God and fully man. We've heard Pastor Bob say that many times, and even Pastor Graf, fully God and fully man. There was no giving up of any of those divine attributes. Now here, here we get to that tricky little phrase where it says the fact of being equal with God. Now, this phrase is not trying to establish the Son's divine nature again. And that's where some commentators kind of trip over this. It isn't trying to say that Christ is God. It already says that, who being in the form of God. It's just talking, referencing, going back to the idea that he is equal with God. <clears throat> he is inherently equal with God. That's a fact. It's looking back at that fact, and you'll understand a little bit more what I mean by that. It's not trying to talk about him possessing uh, divinity. It's just merely saying that is true. And uh, what we'll find here is that Christ did not seize upon or hold on or grab on to the fact of his equality with God. And like I said, we'll, you'll understand that a little bit more as we move, move forward here in this study. Now that word there, seize upon, <clears throat> with the King James has the word robbery, which is <clears throat> kind of a strange word in there that makes it sound like Christ was trying to steal in some way. But that's very confusing. It's a, it's a translation from an old English word that we don't even really uh, use anymore. It doesn't capture the contextual meaning either of what's being talked about here. Other translations uh, could be a thing to be grasped after, seized, held on to, but we have to be very careful about how we define this word and interpret it in the context. Surprisingly, this word here for seize upon is the same word that's used for the rapture, when it says that the, the Lord will snatch or seize up those who are alive. It's the same word, slightly different form, but uh, this, is a, this word only occurs here, this particular word version of the word seize upon occurs here. That's what's another difficulty is Paul used a word that wasn't used a lot uh, in the New Testament. And so we don't have a whole lot of historical data. We have some uh, in the language there. So one of the things this cannot mean uh, is saying retain in the sense of keep, hang on, or keep possession of, such that Christ could let go of some or all of his equality with God to become a man. There's that idea that uh, if you go back to the verse, they're almost saying that he, he um, uh, this idea that uh, Christ did not consider holding on to his equality with God. They try to read that in there, such that he emptied himself, or he put his divinity aside. And this is where the heretics will use something like this, and they're trying to translate that idea seize upon with this idea of that Christ was letting go of something he possessed. And that's not what scripture says. So we have to be careful because again, here's a word that could take a couple of meanings depending on how the, again, context uses it. But the heretics don't care about context. They love just to go in and read whatever they want into a scripture verse to suit their particular theology or doctrine. <clears throat> now, one of the things we know is God cannot stop being God. He can't just put the pause button on who he is. And that's true for the son. The immutability guarantees that. 
God does not change. His nature never changes. The son can't stop being who he is. Scripture also doesn't support that meaning that Christ in some way gave that up in any way. So we know that has to be rejected. We read in Colossians 2.9, it says, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Right? And there's plenty of other scripture verses as well. And so we know Christ never gave up, let go, deactivate, or suppress his divine attributes at any time. There are those who try to teach that Christ just kind of suspended the use of his divine attributes while he was here on earth. And that's also not taught in scripture. <clears throat> that's also something that is uh, outside of what the revelation of God's word says. Uh, Jesus did not stop holding the universe together when he was here on earth. Uh, we know that he has always been eternal, immutable, omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, glorious, uh, and there's more to that as well. And I have a lot in my notes here, a lot of scripture verses that go through all of those attributes and demonstrate those in Christ. And for those who get the notes, you're more than welcome to go through all that. Uh, but we wouldn't have the time to do that tonight. So rather this word seize upon, it talks about, is being used here in Philippians 2, 6, in the sense that he would not seize on or hold on or grab on to the fact of being God as a reason why he would not take the form of a servant as one having the form of God. And there's the contrast. As one who is God, he did not use that as a reason not to take the form of of a servant. Here is then the mind of Christ that we're to emulate. Simply this, being God did not stop the Son from coming into the world to die for our sins. That's what Paul is saying here. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in terms of what that means, being God. It was God the Son's prerogative in all his divine glory as the King of glory who has no selfish ambition or conceit not to be subjected to the scorn, persecution, and suffering at the hands of evil men. They had no right to do what they did to the Son of God. But Christ willingly and selflessly, and there's that word, out of love did not exert his prerogative for our sakes. But he, the Lord of glory, imagine that, the Lord of glory, allowed his enemies to persecute him blaspheme him, plot his death, strike him, and crucify him without God bringing down immediate judgment upon them all. That was God's prerogative. He did not have to go through all of that. He did it for the sake of our redemption. We're told that in verse 8. Hence, we have here the mind of Christ. The salvation of mankind, we know, was always in the perfect plan of God. God always had planned that. But we're talking about God. Uh, he did not have to do all of this, meaning he's God. Subject himself to all of this. But he did out of love. And that is why he is a wonderful and amazing Savior, because he was willing to do that for us. Now consider uh, on this idea of prerogative which prerogative simply means an exclusive or special right, power, or privilege. In Philippians 2, verse 3, compared to verse 6, that uh, about 40% of the Philippians, historically, in the first century, were Roman citizens. And that, that was a privilege. People uh, desired Roman citizenship. They understood the rights, the privileges, and responsibilities that came with that status. They could vote, hold office, own property, avoid some taxes, that'd be nice, sue in court, obtain fair justice, among other things, having access to more opportunities than the common inhabitant. They had special privileges as Roman citizens. The Philippians, they understood what this meant. Thus, they could utilize their status as Roman citizens at any time. So, for example, they could exercise their right to be tried in Rome for a crime. <clears throat> 
rather than a local principality. That's what Paul did, remember? Claimed his Roman citizenship so he could be tried in Rome instead of the local uh, locality there in Judea. It's interesting, too, that with the Roman citizenship came the expectation that the Roman citizen, whether inside or outside the city, must put aside the sense of the individual and focus on the good of the community. They understood this idea of community and what Paul was telling them to put aside their own self-interests. This idea of prerogative, therefore, in verse 6 is supported by Philippians 2.3. Paul says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit. That's empty pride, trying to make a name for yourself. But in humility, consider others as more important than yourselves. You know, that same word consider there that Paul is using is also used here in verse 6 when it says that Christ did not consider the fact of his quality with God as something to be uh, held on to. Paul beseeched the Philippians to consider others more important than themselves and their self-oriented pursuits, namely to have an attitude of service to others rather than self. That's an attitude of selflessness. Being who we are with whatever status and privileges we may have should not hinder or stop us from serving others before ourselves. Christ provided the ultimate example of humility when he put us ahead of himself, that is, put aside his prerogative or sense of individual, and that he was willing to endure the cross, giving little thought to the shame, as we're told in Hebrews 12, too. He, as God, did not deserve to suffer for our sins. He had every right not to undergo this ordeal on our behalf, And he could have just rained down judgment upon mankind. But rather, he valued us more. With our great need of redemption, that he valued his right to remain uh, more than he valued his right to remain unscathed at the hands of evil men and by the intense agony and death of bearing our sins on the cross. That's true love right there. It truly was and is God's right to reveal himself to man in his majesty and his righteousness and not to have subjected himself to that pain and suffering in a lowly human body at the hands of evil men and as the sacrifice for mankind's sin by the most gruesome form of torture and execution of crucifixion. God is God, as we know, is free from all limitations or constraints, being transcendent, having his own perfect and divine interests. He doesn't depend on us or on creation for his subsistence. He exists outside and apart from his creation. Would, God, would the God of creation be required to live as part of the creation? Think about it. Would he be required to do that? The answer is no. He isn't required. He's God. But out of love, he did that. He didn't have to take on a human nature and die on the cross for, him, for his own sake, for himself as if he were somehow deficient in some measure until he underwent this experience to become a better God. He didn't have to do it for himself. He did it for us. He did it for us. Uh, here's an, this is an interesting analogy uh, of an earthly king. Think of an earthly king. Right? Does an earthly king, does he not have the prerogative to rule on his throne over his own kingdom, to live in a protected castle with guards, have servants to carry out the daily tasks, etc.? Yes. He's not expected to live as a commoner among the commoners. That's not expected. He has the prerogatives, the privileges, the rights to live the way he does. Now, we don't have a king here in the United States, I understand that. But when kings ruled, these were considered his prerogatives. Uh, He had those rights. So a king, if he chose to do something like that, probably would have been considered mentally insane to go live among the commoners, right? But the holy God of the universe, the creator, chose to take upon himself humanity and live among us for the purpose of redeeming us. Now, the son could have simply went about his own business as God, the king of all creation and the divine interest of God and paid no mind to humanity's redemption. He could have exerted or taken advantage of his inherent equality with God for the particular purpose of not undergoing the incarnation with all of the suffering involved, 
which suffering he himself did not deserve. But he did not use this as a reason to hold himself back from it. But we know his love brought him into a wooden manger in order to go to a wooden cross. Now, if that doesn't bring a tear to your eye, I don't know what will, because it brings a tear to my eye when I think about what he was willing to do for me. And it's just, mm, I, I just can't understand how people could be so cold to the message of the gospel, other than the depravity of the human heart. Christ's attitude was one of service to mankind to consider our interests of needing salvation from sin over the interest of his own prerogatives. We're told that in Philippians 2.5, when Paul said to them, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Compare that to Philippians 2, 3, and 4, where, where Paul is telling the Philippians to have that same attitude of Christ. He says not to be wrapped up with themselves. Don't let your own self-interest and prerogatives stop you from serving others in humility. We know that Christ washed the feet of his disciples at the Last Supper. And Peter, didn't he object? Like, no, Lord, you can't do this. Because even they understood this idea that, uh, of right, privilege, and prerogative. They didn't feel that, that. They said that was beneath them. But the Lord said, no. Do as I do, right? Don't allow who you are to stop you from humbling yourself in service to others. And Jesus did just that, didn't he? He didn't let who he was, God, stop him from doing something that most people consider to be menial and low. <clears throat> we read in verse 3, Paul said, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem, uh, let each esteem others better than himself. And verse 4, let each of you look out not only for his own interests, he's not talking about selfish interests here, he's talking about our everyday interests, but also look out for the interests of others. <clears throat> so set aside your own prerogatives. Paul is telling the Philippians like Christ did. Don't let them be an obstacle or a reason not to serve others. <clears throat> In Matthew chapter 20, uh, verse 25 to 28, and this is, we're getting close to the end here <laughs> for tonight. Uh, but Jesus called them unto him and said, you know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them. They that are great exercise authority upon them, but it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Hence, Paul says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Verse 5, if our Savior in all of the perfection and glory as God, whose self-interests are pure and holy, was willing to set aside his prerogative and come to earth in the flesh and humbly subject, uh, subject himself to the agony and suffering of the cross as our sin offering, then we as sinners can move past our own interests, our own self, selfish interests to serve the interests of others in humility. And that is, is part of the message in verse 6. And it's also picked up in verse 7. Uh, what a savior. What a savior. Let's come to a word of prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, uh, for your willingness, Lord, to send your son into this world uh, to face what he faced at the hands of evil men and to go to that cross and suffer and bleed and die uh, for the redemption of, of mankind, for us, Lord, for me. It, words can just cannot express that magnitude of love, Lord, just cannot. I just pray, Father, you never let us stop thinking about that, to keep our focus, Lord, on everything you've done for us so that we will serve others.
and not get wrapped up in ourselves. Oh, Lord, you told those believers there in Philippi that message, and it applies to us today, Lord. Please give us the mind, Lord, uh, of your Son, and that we would be selfless and humble uh, in our Christian walk. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Uh, how many people want the notes? There's about 23 pages of notes. I got two. Anybody else?